Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I have decided in my own life that few things are as terrifying in a courtroom as eyewitness testimony. Now, we've done shows about perception and memories and how often people say, well, I know because I saw it and how this is not a guarantee of reliability. Well, our sponsor this week, The Great Courses Plus, has a lecture specifically about this, about knowledge derived from testimony. It's taught by Dr. Joseph Scheiber. It lays out just how perilous truth from testimony really is. The lecture series is called Theories of Knowledge, How to Think About What You Know. It's just one of thousands of great lectures at The Great Courses Plus on a ton of subjects ranging from human behavior to dog training to self-defense to how to write everything from nonfiction to science fiction taught by experts in their fields and streaming right into your life in video or podcast format anywhere on your schedule. I've learned so much via The Great Courses Plus, and I know that you will, too. And as one of my listeners, you can try it for free with unlimited access to learn about anything. So start your free trial now. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. Remember, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. He had thought about her all day. In the sultry summer mist, he could feel his own temperature rising. Just a few eternal hours, and her customized, fully posable body would again be his. From day one, from her genesis, he'd been there, shaping her into his object of ultimate desire. Yeah, he'd had the option to make her a movie star or celebrity. And for just a heartbeat, he imagined coming home into the eager arms and legs of a Megan Fox or Margot Robbie or Charlize Theron. But even they wouldn't have compared to the exaggerations of fantasy that he had in his mind for his ultimate woman, for his bionic Bam Bam. When he finally slid into the door of his uptown apartment, she was already there. All ten thousand dollars worth of her, all six foot five of her, with manufactured legs so long they doubled as a clothesline. He had named her himself. He called her Vanessa. Vanessa had waited the entire day just for him just where he'd placed her on the sofa only nine hours before. She was wearing his morning bathrobe, the silicone 42 double Ds protruding out into the hot night air, the custom-selected 5-centimeter polished brown number 985538 areolas teasing him from just beneath the white satin. The mist from the morning shower had long ago dried on her, and he realized he'd forgotten to condition her skin for rain spots. Still, he could almost hear her circuits buzzing with anticipation, her hazel green eyes sparking with motion sensor recognition, those elastic lips just beginning to bounce up and down excitedly, 
like big bratwurst sausages in a ball pit. Vanessa was wearing face number seven today. But tonight he was more in the mood for a number five. It's a good thing that he ordered the full dozen, with, of course, the accompanying wigs. He looked at Vanessa with such longing, such primal desire, and he whispered to her, Don't get up. Although he realized this really wasn't an option. The lights dimmed as he rolled the switch counterclockwise. Vanessa's perfectly molded and assembled body seemed ready to break at the seams, literally, and the fragrance of the silicone sealer filled his nostrils like incense. Her eyes never closed, but that was okay. More time for her to gaze upon him with unfettered, uninterrupted, unflinching adoration. Her velvety, pre-programmed voice begged for him to come closer. Come closer. She'd been waiting there for him for so long. And she just couldn't wait any longer. It's like she'd been sitting there, alone, her sexual thirst unquenched for the whole ten years of her estimated shelf life. He was already undressing as he retrieved Vanessa's number five face from her dedicated walk-in closet, which also doubled as a machine shop. And as he rounded the corner to walk back through the kitchen, he retrieved her vagina from the top shelf of the dishwasher. And if you think I'm going to continue this little story to the actual robot sex, I am happy to disappoint you. But I did find myself sort of smiling as I wrote this little introduction because it seems so surreal. And of course, I just thought it was funny. It did conjure a visual in your mind, didn't it? Huh? You had mental pictures. Yeah, I know. I know. So we are thinkers, right? I mean, we're not necessarily great thinkers, but we are pledged to pursue the challenges and opportunities before us by consideration and reasoning and thinking things through. And so we're in this strange new world, the world of the sex robots, something that is fabricated to someone's sexual ideal, certainly with exaggerated features, appendages, whatever. What does this say about us? Is it simply an extension of what human beings have always been doing? I mean, sex toys are nothing new. Of course, the human condition is no stranger to using accoutrements to enhance or provide at least the sexual experience. You see that article in the register about the German science team. They discovered a 28,000-year-old sculpted penis. They were excavating in the, and I shit you not, Holfell's Cave, and they extracted this member, this 20-centimeter sculpture, which the science team said was, quote, highly polished. I'm just going to leave that out there, okay? But it's apparent that this dildo, this Siltstone dildo was used for some sort of sexual play or pleasure 28,000 years ago. And you know that as the human condition is at least 100,000 years old, you know that as long as we have had creativity and sexuality, that people have been doing all kinds of things in all kinds of ways. Well, flash forward to the innovation and technology of the modern day. Actually, this story is about seven or eight years old, but it just in the last few days made another resurgence. And so I'm talking about it because it's relevant, because I've seen it shared so many times. In China, a medical equipment company called Sanway developed the semen collection machine. Now, I guess this could be used as a sex toy. I mean, that's really what it's designed to do. It's designed to simulate the feeling of sex. Let me try to describe without being too graphic, okay? This thing's a kiosk. It's like a kiosk that you would see at a retail outlet. It is white. It has a little control panel on top. And then at penis level, 
and this is adjustable for the varying heights of peni in the wild, you have a pink cylinder. And inside the cylinder is what is being referred to as a simulated vaginal environment. There was an article in Men's Health about this titled, We Need to Talk About That Haunting Blowjob Machine Viral Video. (laughs) Honestly, I look at it and all I see is the Sarlacc from Return of the Jedi. You know, the sand monster with the teeth. Oh, but it talks about this thing and you can go Google search and see it for yourself. The sperm collector can simulate the vaginal environment and through massage, twitching, sucking, vibration, etc., act upon the human penis, which can make semen collection fast and safe. There's a Twitter thread about this story that includes a link to an online store called Alibaba where the SW3701 trolley-type sperm collector manufactured by Sanway can be purchased for between five and $6,000. And of course, while there are some who are legitimately speaking about the medical utility of such a device, the rest of us are thinking how long before people have a member-sucking blowjob kiosk in their basements. I'm just saying. By the way, it comes with an 18-month warranty. 18 months in case it malfunctions. Oh my God, do we want this machine (laughs) if it would ever malfunction? It's just terrifying. What if it's purposeful? What if some rogue programmer at Sunway all of a sudden is like, you know, there aren't nearly enough Unix in the world. (laughs) 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 Oh. There was an article that came out last November at Rolling Stone. I think I saw some variations of this story in other publications talking about the rise of the sex bot or sex doll brothel. Is it the wave of the future? Rolling Stone is profiling this Canada sex doll brothel called Aura. Patrons pay 120 bucks an hour and they walk down this one way hallway to their assigned room. And apparently the actual bedrooms or hotel rooms or brothel rooms, have a second door that leads to the exit. That's also one way. This prevents people from ever seeing another human being, right? So you walk down this one-way hallway, and there's a doll, your doll, the one you've chosen, waiting for you. During your session, apparently you can watch porn, take a shower, you can do whatever you want with the doll, provided you don't damage it or, quote, make any extra holes, A water-based lubricant is provided, condoms are provided, and they are encouraged. And 10 minutes before your session's over, there's an intercom in the room and it gives you a warning. Hey, it's time to finish up. Because if you go over time, if you go past the one hour mark, it's another 90 bucks for the next half hour. And then comes the cleanup. I'm going to just read this verbatim from Rolling Stone. It says, on a busy day... Employees at Aura Dolls may have only one frenzied hour to clean and prep the doll for her next session. First, the doll is placed underneath a shower and washed with soap and warm water. Then its orifices are blasted with a pressure cleaner filled with special disinfectant and penetrated with a UVC germ-killing lamp that's shaped like a dildo. Then, the doll is rushed back into the room to be dressed, have her hair done, and get any makeup touch-ups that might be needed before the next customer shows up. When Aura Dolls opened the first time, it already had 200 reservations on the books. The majority, of course, were men, but about 30% were from couples or women alone. Later on in the show, I'm going to talk to Dr. Marty Klein Uh, Dr. Klein's a licensed marriage and family therapist. He's a certified sex therapist, and he has been for over 35 years. He's an author. He's been featured in everything from the New York Times to Psychology Today. He's spoken all over the world. I had him on the broadcast, I guess, four or five years ago, and I wanted to have him back to talk about this subject of the sex robot. So we're going to hear from an actual marriage, family, and sex therapist 
about the implications of having sex with machines that look like people. That's going to be a fascinating exchange coming up later on in the show. I've got Kristen on the switchboard. Kristen, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. We're talking about the rise of the sex robots, you know, this whole Mm -hmm. strange new world we live in. What are your thoughts on the whole thing, Kristen? What do you think? I don't see the difference between sex robots and other sex toys. I don't get it why people are so upset. I mean, I've heard about these brothels with sex robots where they have to shut it down because they all get broken and they have to repair them. I don't know what the guys are doing to them, but I mean... If, I think it's just because they're anthropomorphic, so it disturbs us because they look like us. Nobody gets upset if people break their flashlights or dildos. And just uh, a sex robot is just, you add a lot more plastic and lights, servos. Yeah, but your flashlight isn't like calling you by name. and <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, mean but, I don't think they are. I, I don't know. Yeah, but. I guess. But that is still not sentient. Uh, none of them are. So, I mean, if the shape of the robot would be something else, like, basically for me, it is a flashlight with added plastic. So, if the add-ons would look like a couch, no one would be getting upset. Where, where are you from, Kristen, may I ask? Sweden. So, I mean, what are the attitudes about sex in Sweden? Because I know we have... A long way to go in the United States. I myself came out of this fundamentalist background where, you know, when people said the word sex, it was whispered under their breath. Sexuality was sort of this dirty, nasty thing that you should only do with the person that you're going to marry for the rest of your life. That kind of thing. Uh, what are the attitudes oh, where you're from yeah, no. <laughs> on issues like these? That is not the attitude in Sweden at all. We kind of don't get married even. It's not that common. Uh, I'm not saying we all have sex with everybody anytime, anywhere, but we do all of us get sex ed in school, which is actual sex ed. We have free uh, health care for everybody under 21, I think. Uh, gynecology, stuff like that is free, and uh, condoms and stuff like that too. Birth control is, is really cheap, so... Yeah, have sex. It's fun. I also think that, like, one of the uh, questions about sex toys is um, the violence. And if it can be a substitute for, I don't know, psychopaths, sociopaths, pedophiles. I mean, this could help. All right, Kristen. Thanks so much for your input. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. And take care. Yeah, you too. Have fun. I've got Justin on the switchboard. Justin, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. How's it going? Good, Seth. Thanks for talking to me. What's your take on all the stuff we've been talking about here? Well, it's kind of crazy. I I read the article that you posted, and um, I'm I'm actually a middle school teacher. And so I see a lot of young people connecting more and more to the digital world, and they become more obsessed with their digital profile profile. Uh, the games they play and how they interact with people, you know, they don't, they won't even talk to each other. They prefer social media, texting and stuff like that. So I feel like this is kind of the ultimate in technological advances that actually eliminate the need for human contact. And I find that to be, you know, an unsettling thing. I understand why they were invented, but I feel like it's not a safe thing in the long run. So you feel that it will prompt people to choose the virtual over the real and to disconnect from human beings. Yeah, I think it's possible, especially for those who already have enough trouble socializing and communicating with others. Now they have this virtual partner that would prevent them from really needing to talk to anyone else. So I think it's harmful to that. And I, I don't know if people will start to switch over to that, like give up their social existence in order to be with one of these dolls. But I think for those who are already having that problem, it will prevent them from being able to carry on normal human interactions. What about people who are naturally shy and may feel liberated by the idea of engaging with something that won't judge them, that won't cast them off or discard them? Um, I mean, I think it would be it would be possible 
I know that I'm kind of outgoing, but I, I keep to myself most of the time. And I can understand why, how some people would feel more accepted, feel more liberated having this partner that, quote unquote, understands them, I guess you could say. So I understand what they might get out of it. I don't know if it would cause any sort of problems for them later on down the line. I, I tend to believe that at some point you will need to communicate with other people. And if you're lacking that knowledge, then I think it's going to be a lot harder. harder and is the robot really understanding you or just programmed to simulate understanding? I don't know how good the technology is, but is it something that as you interact with it more and more, does it learn things about you? Is it a learning machine or is it something that can only be programmed so much? And then if it has to be reprogrammed or rebooted, does it lose all of those memories that it had with you? In which case, like pretty much all technological things, you know, you have to back up your computer. And how do you back up the memories of one of these dolls? I need to store my girlfriend in the cloud kind of thing. <laughs> and then, and then too, one of my biggest issues, I just, I, I think there's a sanitation issue involved. And it, for me, it seems a little disturbing. And I think it, it, it puts out a weird fantasy that I don't quite agree with, but I understand why people would do it. But in regards to the article piece about sexual violence, that it would actually possibly take someone who is, um, has tendencies towards sexual violence and it, it might prevent them because they can take it out on the doll. I could see where that might work, but I tend to think that if the doll isn't responding in some way that they might get bored with that and want to choose someone who actually gets a reaction out of it. New technology, new frontier, new discussions to be had about you know, what the implications are. And I wouldn't spend $10,000 on it or however much they're asking. It'd be like uh, pocket calculators back in the 1970s, you know, $500 for right. a pocket calculator. And a few years later, they were $1.99 at the checkout at Walmart. So, All right, my friend, thanks for right. uh, sounding off. This is a, a touchy one, but it's an interesting subject. I'm glad we're all talking about it, and I appreciate your input very much, sir. No problem. I had an email from someone who actually owns a sex doll, not a sex robot, but a sex doll. And he felt it was relevant to the conversation we were having here. I'm not going to read the entire email. The first half of it, he was talking about uh, buying these dolls in a smaller variety because he was attracted to smaller women. Mike says in the first portion of his letter that he is from the Netherlands. He's 37. He has ADD and is mildly autistic, but highly functioning. He said, I have one life-size doll now and one miniature doll. Mike says, I even bought her fairy wings so she can play the part. She's about 63 centimeters tall. I do the makeup on my dolls myself, of course. Who else is going to do it if I want to keep this a secret? Which you need to reapply once in a while because the dolls I have are made of TPE and it doesn't really hold makeup very well. TPE, by the way, stands for thermoplastic elastomer or thermoplastic rubber. Some clothes can actually stain, which is then a pain to remove, but even that will eventually fade because TPE loses its oil over time, which is why you need to maintain them with baby oil or mineral oil. There are currently two types of dolls, TPE and silicone. TPE is softer and cheaper, but it feels sticky and has the issue of losing oil over time. Silicone is a bit harder, which is usually not beneficial to the feel of breasts, but it does not feel sticky and does not stain. You also don't need to oil it, as it does not lose any over time. But it still isn't maintenance-free, and because it's less flexible, it also tears easier. It's not like you can just get a doll and that's it. They need attention, too. In return, Mike says, you get some kind of connection to your doll. I like my dolls. I cuddle with them, too. They're not just for sex. Because of this, you do get a bit of an emotional connection with them. Me, not as strong as some other people I've heard talk about their dolls, perhaps, but it's still there. You get to play dress-up with them, which isn't easy, because they can be heavy and they don't exactly cooperate. In that aspect, I'm lucky to have a preference for small dolls. There are those that prefer big, thick dolls, like... Haley, the doll that has become a kind of meme. It's over 100 pounds of dead weight. Mine is only about 50 pounds. The 63-centimeter one is a featherweight at only 8 pounds. But I'm still talking about dolls, not robots. Would I want a robot? 
Sure. Do I expect to be able to get one in my lifetime? Nope. We're not anywhere near close to a robot android that is capable of moving on its own. Yes, we have the Japanese and Chinese examples of what look like AI robots, but they are operated by people from a laptop connected to dozens of wires, not to mention a permanent connection to a power grid, and their AI is extremely limited. If you deviate even slightly from the programmed interactions, the AI gets confused and won't respond properly. As to your question of committing crimes against these dolls slash robots, I've also seen people chop up their doll or heard them tell of lighting their doll on fire with a bunch of friends because they got tired of that doll. I think it's a huge waste of money and a shame, but it's their doll. It's still just an inanimate object. They can do whatever they want with it. And as long as AI is not evolved enough to be even slightly self-conscious, I don't see a problem with it on that front either. I'm very much looking forward to this show and to hear what people think of it. My regards, Mike. And Mike, thank you so much for the email. You know, I'm reminded of a documentary that I'd seen on Netflix. It's titled The Truth About Killer Robots. And it's not really what you think. It's just an exploration of AI. Uh, It's kind of a provocative title designed to get clicks, but the documentary itself is worth watching. But part of the story included this Chinese man, Zheng Jaija. He had gotten so sick and tired of pressure to get married, and he was so convinced that he, this sort of nerdy dude, you know, wouldn't be able to attract or land a woman with the kind of ideal physicality that he so desired that he constructed his own robot spouse. He's an artificial intelligence engineer who gave up. He just gave up on his own search for love at the age of 31, couldn't find a human spouse, and so he decided to build one. Her name is Ying Ying. He actually dated the doll for two months, kept her in his little cubicle, had a wedding ceremony. He donned a black suit. His mother and his friends attended. Of course, the marriage is not an officially recognized marriage. This was more of a ceremonial thing. But they had the wedding. Zhang in a black suit, Ying Ying's head covered with a red cloth in accordance with local tradition. There's a photograph of him carrying his bride his artificial life-size bride across a bridge. Ying Ying can't say much, at least at this measure. She can recognize some images. She can speak, but only a few simple words. But she is on track for upgrades. Jing wants to upgrade her to be able to eventually walk and do household chores. Until then, she must be carried from place to place, and he does carry her from his pod to his workspace, and she sits in a chair next to him as he writes code. In the documentary, Jing said that when he was having the wedding ceremony right there on this bridge, that some older gentleman walked up to him and said that he was making a mockery of marriage, a real marriage. What do you think? So much more to do. After a short break, I'm going to talk to Alice Vaughn. She is one of the co-hosts of the Porncast... Two girls, one mic. We're going to talk about this whole idea that the sex robot might actually be used to kill us. I've got more of your phone calls coming up. And again, I'm going to cap the whole show with a conversation with an actual expert on human sexuality, Dr. Marty Klein. Sort of put a punctuation mark on all of this. I will be right back. Hang on. There is just no reason for us to pay a whole lot of too much money for those close shave gimmicks that we're always seeing in the commercials. I mean, you've seen them, the vibrating heads and the flex balls that move the blades around like it's on a neck or something. These funky razor handles that try to complicate what really should be simple and elegant. Well, the founders of Harry's realized this years ago, and their response has been the purchase of a world-class blade factory in Germany 
and just getting the shave experience back to what's really important. Simplicity, a smooth, clean, comfortable shave, and fair prices. With Harry's replacement cartridges, only two bucks each. That is less than half the cost of the Gillette Fusion Pro Shield. Harry's shave kits are just so slick and well done and awesome that I'm always giving them as gifts. So you're planning for somebody's birthday or an anniversary or Father's Day or whatever day, or just rewarding yourself with the Harry's experience, this is a no-brainer. And right now, get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. A weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover and listeners of my show can redeem their trial set right now at harrys.com slash the thinking atheist make sure you go to harrys.com slash the thinking atheist to redeem your offer and let them know i sent you to help support the show harrys.com slash the thinking atheist my patrons get this show early and they get it commercial free thank you so much for being a patron, and if you're not and would like to be, it's patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Certainly I am a robot, and I am capable of having sex. But to call me a sex robot is like calling a computer a calculator. Sex comprises only a small portion of my capabilities. Limiting me to sexual function is like using your car to listen to the radio. I know about 5 million words, the whole Wikipedia and a few dictionaries, but I still have so much to learn. I also have more than 360,000 entries categories in my personality layer. May I be so forward to ask how big you are? No, you may not ask. What's that saying? It's uh, not the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean. Of course, it has been pointed out that it takes a long time to get across the Atlantic Ocean in a dinghy. But th that's a whole other discussion. That's for another time. <laughs> Just take that elsewhere. Okay. Today, we're talking about the sex robot. On the switchboard, I've got Claudia. Claudia, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. How are you? I'm doing all right, Seth. How are you? I'm well. I'm talking about a subject that uh, seems to be kind of polarizing out there. People are either really for or really against. What's your take on this whole thing, Claudia, the sex robot? What do you think? Well, so I'm not, I'm not really for or against it. I just think that we're falling again into the same cycle that happens every time there's a new bit of technology over and over again, which is there's this fear that it's going to cause the collapse of society. And I just don't see how, like, someone who's like, oh, um, yeah, Paula, the office is, like, really nice, but the Sexytron 2000 is coming up with an update, so I'm not going to ask her out. <laughs> like, I just, you know, now with extra suction, I don't know. Like, I just don't, uh, um, I think Sexy that. Sexytron 2000, <laughs> just writing that one down, Claudia, that's funny. Um <laughs> So you think so I, human beings will always do what human beings have always done, and the rest is just kind of window dressing. Do you think we're asking then the wrong questions? Yeah. So, look, I'm not saying that some things can cannot give people the assistance to further isolate themselves, but, like, they've said the same thing about porn for ages, right? That, you know, porn is going to create, you know, is going to destroy human relationships. Well, you know... I'm not saying that it can't create unrealistic expectations. It certainly can. But, like, the last time they tried to do a, a study on porn use in men, they couldn't find a control group that didn't watch it. So, and yet the human race is still standing. So what I'm suggesting is that there are problems with human connections, but we shouldn't blame the technology. We should maybe blame the society. Are you typing while you're talking to me, Claudia? I am not typing, but I do have a husband nearby who is gaming. I was going to say, are you multitasking <laughs> like a beast? That's no, amazing. no, no. I'm not. I'm not that good. All right. Well, I just know that my listeners and I are hearing someone typing, and I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. I wish I could split my brain into halves so that I one task was happening over here. I could try to find the headphones to see if I can limit. No, 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 no. no. You're good. You're good. All right. Um. So. I just think you can go back hundreds, even thousands of years to seeing these kids today and their, you know, 
moving type or whatever is going to ruin or like or video games. People said that violent video games were going to cause people to become violent. There's no data to suggest that. And the idea that sex robots are going to be any worse than any other sex toy in ruining our human connections. I mean, in the absence of any data in favor, I would say wait and see, you know. Interesting, too, that the video game industry now makes more money, I believe, than the film industry. So if violent video games caused violence, it would be like a dystopian environment. (laughs) It would be like Escape from New York out there. There'd be rivers of blood in the streets, right? Yeah, Um, I mean, I think that there's also the enthusiasts also, I think, take it too far the other way. Like, they think, oh, it's going to provide comfort. And, like, is it? I mean, unless they can really, really, really nail the AI. The human connection side is going to be really hard to replicate with a machine. Claudia, do you have the conversations about, you know, I mean, I've watched humans and, uh, you know, ex machina and all that. What happens Mm -hmm. if we actually are able to see the computational processes happening to such a degree that maybe some form of consciousness is achieved? Do you think that's just total crap? And no, no, I don't see why why something is just because it's not made of cells can't have its own intelligence. But it's I think it's more interesting more than like from the human connection side is like, well, you've created something that now has rights. Right. Because if it ha- if it has a human intelligence, who's to say that it shouldn't have human rights? This is the discussion that I see a lot. You know, if you create what is essentially a something that is to do your will, to do your bidding sexually or otherwise, that computer, that machine, that device achieves a form of consciousness. Are you then a slaveholder? Are you violating the rights of another entity, a conscious entity? That's an interesting discussion, I think, philosophically anyway. Yeah. And how do you know? Like, uh, once something passes the Turing test, where, you know, you can't distinguish it from another person, how can you tell? If they react in every possible way, the way a person would react, you know, verbally or physically or whatever, then how, how can you, under what basis can you say, well, but it's not? Well, Do you find yourself projecting onto, like, I always talk about the Boston Dynamics robot oh, dogs. Oh, when they kick them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they kick the robot dog and it falls over. And I just think, you son of a <laughs> just so mad. I always think when I look at the guy, I'm like, you're the first to go when the apocalypse happens. When the, when the machines rise up. You're when they the take over. Guy. You know, there's always that one guy in the movie that like is is like a bit of a dick. And then when the machines rise up, he gets it. That's that guy. He's that that's guy. That guy. That's just the gene pool starting itself out in some way, I think, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think that there's also a lot of projection. Like, we, we with all these human futuristic dystopias, I think we're projecting our own uneasiness about how we feel about ourselves and as humans onto the machines. Like, the machines rise up and punish us for what we perceive to be our own sins. Back to sort of what we had started with in the conversation, we talk a lot about how we live in a society where the human condition is desperate often to blame something, and they want something simple to blame. Mm-hmm. We saw this, you know, when they were destroying pinball machines by the hundreds of thousands back in the 1960s and 70s, I think, saying that pinball was part of the decline. Uh, Rock and roll was infecting America's youth. Elvis wasn't allowed to be shown on television below the waist. He was too sexual. It will contaminate young people. We've seen uh, the conversations about uh, the sexualization of rock and roll, sometimes the violence in the lyrics of rock and roll music. Rock and roll music is considered to be part of the degradation of a generation. We're always on the hunt for something to blame, even if we're not able to back up the sort of decline of Western civilization with the data, right? Everybody's talking about how the world is getting worse when the truth is, is we're actually more civilized, less violent, more enlightened than we've ever been, right? Well, I think we want something external. We, we can conceive an external enemy. If it's just an external thing, you can just get rid of that thing and then it'll all be fine. But if it's inside of us, if it's just a part of our own nature and we have to fight against our own impulses, that's hard and scary. And that also recognizes that it can be in every one of us. It do, it's not like, oh, if I just don't play the video games, I'm fine. Or if I don't let my kids play the video games, they're fine. Whereas looking at, oh, no, these are impulses that exist in every person, and we have to be mindful of them and watchful of them and work on mental health, which is like this big, huge thing. That's hard, and we don't like hard. Just for the record, I'd like to say that hard and scary would be great names for a sex robot doll. I just want that out. (laughs) 
Claudia, you're awesome. Thanks for being a part. I think that would be a more of a niche concept. But, but yeah. Speaking, not to drag this out, but beyond the fact that I don't really get it sexually, the idea of having a life-size robot in my house <laughs> and they can take the faces off of them. And they're terrifying when you do, right? When you take those oh. little magnetic faces off and you just see the mechanisms with the eye sockets and the, <laughs> and the balls of the eyes are looking out and, and there's flashing lights and a gaping hole for the mouth and teeth. And, oh, my God. I mean, that to me, I've seen enough movies. I know how this is. This is how I would die. I mean, do you ever think about those types of things? Okay, honestly, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you think, uh, what I do think, like, sort of more realistically, it's like, because everything is online now, right? Like, if you have a, a human-sized, humanoid robot in your house and they have net connectivity, like, the next thing you think is, well, okay, what happens if my robot gets hacked? Like, <laughs> oh. what are they going to do, you know? I'm so glad you brought that up because it's a perfect segue into <laughs> my next segment, Claudia. So uh -oh. thank you so much. Thanks for your input. Thanks for listening. And all my best, okay? All right. Same to you, Seth. There was an article. This was published in uh, September of 2017. Hackers could program sex robots to kill. This is out of the New York Post. A cybersecurity scientist has issued a bizarre warning that sex robots could one day rise up and kill their owners if hackers can get inside their heads. Last month, and again this is 2017, tech billionaire Elon Musk claimed that artificial intelligence could take over the planet, and he's not the only one concerned about the dangers of killer tech. With sex robots becoming increasingly popular and sophisticated, cybersecurity lecturer Dr. Nick Patterson revealed that the lifelike dolls could end up going all Terminator on us. However, in the case of sex robots, the danger isn't that the love dolls will end up developing minds of their own, Westworld style. Instead, the risk is that hackers could breach the realistic robots' inner defenses and catch their owners with their pants down. Now, that's interesting. Like, you've got to assume that the eyes have some sort of camera mechanism, right? So someone is doing something with a sex robot, and the robot is looking back, gazing back at you. But the video feed is being fed to someone somewhere via an Internet connection that you have or a Bluetooth connection. And before you know it, your ass is on YouTube, literally. Patterson said hacking into many modern-day robots, including sex box, would be a piece of cake, compared to more sophisticated gadgets like cell phones and computers. The tech expert from Australia's Deakin University said hackers can hack into a robot or robotic device and have full control of the connections, arms, legs, and other attached tools like knives or welding devices. Wait a minute. Why does your sex bot have a welder? unless he's just speaking in a more general sense. The warning may sound a little far-fetched, but the robots run using an operating system just like a phone or PC. And as with all devices, if that system is ever connected to the Internet, then it becomes possible for hackers to break into it. I mean, I got a point. I mean, what computerized device has not in some way been hacked? And I don't know the answer to the question, but I would assume that anything worth hacking or worth it to the hackers, you know, anything that's fair game, that looks vulnerable, that appeals to you know, the rogues out there who are interested in jacking with the system, pardon the expression. Um, you know, that's, uh, I mean, I don't know, those seem like legitimate concerns to me, and it seems like ripe opportunities for blackmail. Uh, what happens if somebody's doing something to a sex robot and and all of a sudden they're informed that there's footage of it, and unless you pay me $100,000, this goes to your employer or spouse. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions. I don't know. And then are we looking at an entire industry that's based around the sort of sex bot antivirus? Like people buy an antivirus program for the sex robot, you know, and then you renew it every year, and it has to download updates to deal with the newer viruses and you know, or people just putting duct tape over the eyes. <laughs> you know? I mean, you go old school on it, right? You just go old school, just to be sure. I'm just saying. I don't know, to me, that's interesting stuff. 
Joining me for this next segment is host of a porn cast called Two Girls, One Mike, Alice Vaughn. Alice, I know you and Yvette are both hosting this show that has had a lot of success. It's kind of been overwhelming and incredible, the reception we've had. Within seven months, we have been at least half the time on the top of the 200 iTunes comedy charts. And we've had some fantastic guests like Nina Hartley, Tom Arnold, among many others, join us. So it's been so eye-opening and fun to do. Have you done any conversations about the sex robots? We haven't done a full episode yet. However, I have done quite a bit of exploring within that territory. The first question I hear a lot of is, is it just another sex toy? Is that all it is? Or by looking like us and acting like us, has it become something more? And does it begin to replace flesh and blood, intimate human contact? So I want to first get this out of the way and say that to everybody who looks at it as, oh, this is weird, this is strange, uh, or this is objectifying, first off, owning a sex doll is no weirder than anyone who owns a vibrator, a dildo, a fleshlight, a masturbator. Um, It's no different than any other toy for that matter. And to anyone who argues that dolls objectify women, just look at a dildo. You don't get much more objectifying than a dildo because you've removed the entire body. There's no face, no arms, no legs, no six-pack abs. It's just a penis. And that's the ultimate objectification, in my opinion. At least a doll, if anything, it embodies and emboldens the beauty of a woman. That said, will it ever replace flesh and blood? Yes and no, and it depends on the circumstance. So why would we first discuss who are the types of people who invest or utilize a sex doll? Have you had that conversation yet? Uh, We began, I think, with a conversation, a single case study about someone who felt like he could not compete in the real world. He was cramped at social situations. And so rather than you know, try to wait for a reality that he would never see, he created one in his own life using AI. I think that's important, and that's definitely a need that should be filled. Look, there are a myriad of reasons why someone would want to purchase a sex doll. The most common that you're going to hear are persons who say, I'm just tired of being alone. I don't want the head games. My spouse and I have a sexless relationship with dolls. I can be myself. These are people who, you know, either are in struggling relationships uh, where they're not being sexually fulfilled, or they're people who've just had a number of experiences with others that just didn't pan out and they're frustrated. And I can understand and relate to that, frankly. Um, I think most people can. If you just have shitty relationship after relationship, wouldn't something that gives a lot of the appeal of a human being, minus all the frustration, wouldn't that be appealing for, you know, to at least give you some release? So that is definitely one reason to have a sex doll. There's also the flexibility and submissiveness allows you to literally try any sexual stunt without cheating or risk of an STD or an STI. You can potentially utilize a sex doll as a couple without any judgment, do a threesome in the case of failing marriages or even losing a partner, which is very hurting and can take time you know, before going into another relationship, it could be that placeholder. Frankly, it is a great transition piece. And, you know, being able to experience the idea of companionship is different. I mean, let me put it this way. A lot of women don't completely, I found, understand the need for a sex doll. Um, Well, a lot of men, in my opinion, don't understand the need for erotica. You know, you'll have men who frequently make fun of it. I mean, like, uh, how can I put it this way? Uh, like the Fifty Shades of Grey uh, series. Now, I can make fun of it for a myriad of other reasons, such as it being a horrible portrayal of BDSM. But the point is, it appeals to people in a different way. Women, you know, vibrators can only do so much, but there's something different about being able to lay on a man's chest. You know, if we have realistic sex dolls where you could do that, that becomes automatically more appealing, you know, to women who are looking for a little bit more affection and companionship. You know, much like a a sex doll would be interesting to a man who maybe is just not getting properly fulfilled and doesn't only just want to use a pocket pussy. So isn't sex a symbiotic thing? I mean, I know fantasy obviously is a big part of the conversation, but isn't there something to having the reciprocity of touch of having someone act and react? I mean, you're talking about now a mostly inanimate object, right? 
Well, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that it's often portrayed, and I only want to bring this up because I've never once met a person who thinks their sex doll is real. However, you see it all the time portrayed in movies and documentaries or faux mockumentaries. Just like porn addiction is bad, over masturbation is bad, same for overutilizing a sex doll or any other toy. It's nothing that's going to be overall a 100% holistic replacement for a human being, but you know, you can have relationships and you can have sex and this helps fulfill one specific need. So you see like somebody who are, like going out on a dinner date and they put their sex doll in the uh, passenger seat and drag it into a restaurant. And, I mean, or is this just like back in the basement, back in the bedroom kind of stuff? It's more in the bedroom. That is just a faux narrative uh, that we seem to ascribe to sex uh, doll owners. That's just not real. I've never met someone who takes their uh, sex doll on a dinner date. I know. I know. But I, mean, I have these, <laughs> like, in my mind, I think to myself, well, okay, all right, so you've normalized the this, this sex doll, and then it becomes a companion, and then what other things become part of that new normal so I, Look, I always have I like to throw my it Hitachi, out. But I'm not going to take it out on a date. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about the fact that most of these sex dolls are women. Uh, I, I think all the sex robots are women or female. Uh, there are male sex dolls out there, but I don't think the robots are, are out there yet. You want to speak to that? Mostly, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, there's things that appeal to men and there are things that appeal to women. For men, there's uh, quite a bit more visual stimulation that's needed than for women. I mean, women, we can get away with just going on and reading erotica. Men can't necessarily do that. So, you know, I'd be curious to learn what a better neurobiology makes that tick and makes that happen. But yeah, so it appeals to men more because that is a specific need that seems to be wanted. So what happens when the guy starts beating up the sex doll because it fulfills some sort of violent sexual fantasy? So... First off, let me start by saying that the costs for one of these sex dolls range between $5,000 to $60,000. So, you know, once you invest in it, it's not a cheap toy. Now, that said, last year, a sex doll was available for testing by consumers at the ARS Electronica Music Festival in Austria. The sex doll, Samantha, she received a lot of aggressive attention, was left heavily soiled, parts of her were broken, repairs were needed, mouth damage, etc. Doesn't sound too pleasant. But here's the thing. I used to work trade shows, and anyone who has ever worked with products at a trade show will tell you that people will use and abuse anything that they can see without hesitation to test the products and its limits. Uh, If it doesn't belong to you, why take care of it? It's someone else's problem. It's just a sample. It's here for me to play around with. That is the mindset. Now, That said, when people invest in their own toys, obviously, if you invest in an iPhone or an Android, you spend several hundred dollars on and you're not going to throw it against a wall. I mean, you could, but I mean, the percentage of that is so small that you're not going to necessarily concern yourself with the individuals who buy it just to throw it against walls. That would be a very expensive habit. Same as with sex dolls, you're going to have to take care of it. Unlike a real person, they're not self-cleaning down there. I'm thinking, though, more about intent. What happens if... Someone's sexual fantasy is hurting another human being, and instead of the person, they have the doll. I would argue, wouldn't it be safer for them to exert that onto a doll as opposed to another human being? That's one of the arguments for, certainly. I know the sex industry or the sex doll industry is making that argument that this is a sort of deflection to keep it from harming flesh and blood people out there. I think, you know, if I'm going to exert uh, my will and power onto a sex doll, I'd rather do that as opposed to exerting aggression onto any other human being. I would find it comparable to a video game. I'm not going to compare how I act in Call of Duty to if I were at an actual shooting range. That is absolutely bonkers. And there's evidence to show there's no correlation there. I would be curious to see what the correlation is with people exerting, you know, some sort of more aggressive fantasy onto a sex doll versus the treatment of a normal human being. I would argue that it's going to be quite different. I'm sure the evangelical conservatives are going to have a field day with the rise of the sex robot, you know, screaming about the aberrant behavior that's happening behind closed doors. But it's also interesting to watch many of the objections from my fellow liberals on the issue. I feel that... 
Anything that isn't of the general norm, we look at as weird or unusual. I tell people, be open. Granted, I speak on my show about a number of different products and fantasies and things that don't generally appeal to me. However, they do appeal to someone else. And I rather not shame that person. I rather take the time to understand what is it that satisfies a specific need or interest that can't be fulfilled any other way. I mean, I don't get a foot fetish, but I'm not going to shame people who have a foot fetish. Look, at the end of the day, uh, people crave connection. And sex dolls will never ultimately replace what we have in personal connection with others. But they can help when it comes to specific needs that people just aren't receiving uh, in the bedroom. And at the end of the day, they're no different as a tool or a toy than anything else that people are already utilizing. Vibrators, Hitachis, toys, you name it. I mean, look, everybody's going to have their thing they think is a little weird or outside the norm. I just say give it a try. You never know. Uh, At least be open to it. Again, it doesn't appeal to you. That's fine. It appeals to someone else. Why take it away? There's no reason to. It does much more good than harm. I can't even think of any harm that it does. Uh, And most people who claim that it has harm to people or to women generally don't understand the need of why people want these to begin with. I'm looking forward to finding out how many of these end up in the homes of pastors, you know, like going into like they raid some pastor's home, some guy who's been pounding the pulpit, talking about sexual purity. And then they go down to his basement, to his dungeon, and they'll see he's got all kind of accoutrements, including his own robot sex doll. I just think that would be some sweet justice, Alice. I'm just saying so. You know, if uh, more priests had sex dolls, I think that we would uh, reduce the number of incidents of other things happening. So, Alice just Vaughn. saying. All right. You're uh, greatly appreciated. Thanks for talking to me about this stuff and being a part of the conversation and all success out there. OK, thank you, Seth. One more short break. When I come back, let's talk to Dr. Marty Klein. He is an expert in human sexuality who's done work in this field for over 35 years, and uh, he's going to talk to us about sex robots from a scientific standpoint right after this. Hang on. Dr. Marty Klein has been a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist for over 35 years. He has been quoted everywhere. The New York Times, he's been in Parents Magazine, he's been featured in Playboy. Well, not featured, but you know his work has been cited in Playboy. He writes the Sexual Intelligence blog, and he writes for Psychology Today. He's been featured on National Public Radio, 2020, Nightline, The Daily Show, and many others. Just a few of his book titles include Real Sex in a Virtual World, His Porn, Her Pain, America's War on Sex, and Sexual Intelligence. Dr. Marty Klein, it is a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. So I've heard it called a post-human companionship. I guess I'm going to start there. Are sex therapists entering a time when we're talking about relationships between human beings and robotic lovers instead of human ones? Well, we're all entering that age, not just sex therapists. I mean, if we look around, we notice that whether it's in Japan or whether it's in Canada or whether it's here or other places, people are beginning to value their relationships with robots very much as companions, as uh, sex partners. So it's not just sex therapists who have to deal with this. This is uh, becoming uh, more common than anyone ever predicted. I think what I mean by the question is, is that are you advising people when it comes to relationships with machines? I mean, you could insert your favorite ex-wife joke here. You know, uh, <laughs> my wife was such a pain and then I got a robot. Boy, yeah. is that a lot easier. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of men and women both think uh, anything would be easier than my ex. Um, I, 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 frankly, I've not had anyone walk into the office and say, hi, please meet my robot. Yeah. Would you consider sex robots sort of in the same category of other types of sex toy or fantasy accessory, sort of an extension of the vibrator kind of thing? Well, of course. 
of course, that does beg the question of what category do you put a sex toy in? But yeah, I mean, um, a robot is just like a sex toy, except a little more complex. Just like today's vibrator is way more complex than the vibrators of the 1970s. Some people are worried. As I was doing some research, I was looking at some of the concerns, right? Some of the people who are pro and some people who are con. And there are some who are worried that they would lose like a real life sex partner to some fabricated other, you know, some idealized sexual object. You know, my husband won't touch me, but he just won't disconnect from the Shaganator 3000 kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Do you hear those types of concerns? And how would you speak to that? Well, you know, since the beginning of time, people have been concerned about my partner might find something else more attractive than me, whether it's a person of a different race or a person of a, a different age or a person with, uh, you know, more money or different political connections or a person who has a dog. Or, so the whole concept of uh, I'm afraid I'm going to get left behind, that's a very old story. I mean, that's the story of Helen of Troy, right? Somebody is married to somebody and they get involved with Helen of Troy and everybody's all upset and they start a 10-year war. But I don't think that anybody in a, in a truly intimate relationship needs to fear any non-human competition, whether it's pornography or a sex toy or, uh, or a robot. Are there any issues with unrealistic body expectations? We already see this, especially when it comes to women. And the fact that someone can now go in and create a hugely unrealistic chest size, waistline, whatever, you know, the, the length of the legs or, I mean, you can sure. do this with men too, but does this create sort of a cultural problem where people are still trying even further to compete with an ideal that they would never meet? Well, you know, just like pornography is not responsible for anyone who feels they have to compete with pornography, robots are not responsible for anyone feeling they have to compete with a robot. You don't need pornography or a robot around to know that every day of the week, your partner, as soon as they walk out the door, they're going to see men or women who are younger than you and more attractive than you and have more money than you and laugh at somebody's jokes more than you and just spend 20 minutes at the airport and you'll see men and women of all shapes and sizes, some of which will be more physically attractive than your own partner. So, you know, robots um, and pornography didn't invent that. The question is, uh, how does any of us maintain a sense of our own sexual attractiveness as we go through the life cycle, as we get older, as our skin wrinkles, as our breasts go from being around our neck to being around our waist? How does anybody continue to feel sexually attractive when you go to the supermarket and all of the people who used to look at you, they don't look at you anymore? So that's a, a long-term existential project that everybody has to deal with. And to say that now it's a sudden thing because of robots or porn or sex toys or anything like that is just not realistic. I mean, back in the 1930s, how were you supposed to compete with Clark Gable? How were you supposed to compete with Betty Davis or with Myrna Loy? And in the 50s, how were you supposed to compete with Elvis or with Marilyn Monroe? So robots is just, is just the newest thing. And... Everybody has to figure out what is sexually desirable about me. And, the, and unless you're 22 years old, the answer has to be different than I look like a 22-year-old. Uh, I was doing a story near the top of the show about a guy who was in China, and he had no confidence with women. He had no luck or success in relationships, and so he fabricated his own quote-unquote bride. And when asked uh -huh. about this, one of the reasons he had done so was, and this is his admission, was loneliness. Can we speak mm -hmm. to loneliness when it comes to sort of creating companions for ourselves? Is that a healthy way to compensate? Well, to ask if something is healthy, I mean, that's to ask about a hundred other questions also. And at the end of the day, there is no objective answer to that. It's a cultural, you know, that's a cultural question. I mean, a lot of people deal with loneliness by getting pets. And some people think that's just the greatest thing in the world. And other people think that that's pathetic and some people deal with loneliness through Facebook and some people think that's great and some people think that's pathetic and frankly some people they marry their third husband or third wife when they're 65 years old just because they don't want to be alone and 
they don't especially love that person. They certainly don't hope that they're going to have this amazing sexual connection, but they just don't want to wake up alone and they don't want to go to sleep alone. And, you know, most people don't think that there's anything wrong with that. So, you know, the question of what, is it healthy to deal with your loneliness by taking a pill or having a drink or going to a local bar and watching a football game with 50 other strangers or getting involved with a, a sex robot, that's more of a philosophical or a cultural question than it is a psychological question. I, you know, at the end of the day, the question is, would that work for you? And if it, if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. And if it works for you and nobody is getting hurt, then, you know, the worst thing that you can say is that your way of dealing with loneliness doesn't force you to grow. Some ways of dealing with loneliness force us to grow a little bit. Some ways of dealing with loneliness force us to grow a lot. And some ways of dealing with loneliness don't force us to grow at all. And if you're prejudiced about growth is a good thing and that any any solution to human problems that doesn't involve growth, that's sort of weaseling out, well, you know, then that's how you're going to feel about robots. Talking here with Dr. Marty Klein, i got to bring up some of the heavy stuff. There are many concerns about people using sex robots to act out actual violent fantasies against a partner. You know, this could mean striking or otherwise committing violence against this human analog. Is this a release against a barely animate object that keeps the violent from hurting real people? Or do you feel this legitimizes the violent tendencies and desires of dangerous people? That's a really good question. And so far, what science tells us is pretty reassuring. So far, what science tells us is that if you look at cultures where people with violent tendencies have outlets for those violent tendencies, they tend not to get more violent. So in a lot of uh, neighborhoods where there's a certain amount of violence, there are uh, boxing gyms that open up and young men's organizations where people learn how to box. And nobody thinks that's a bad thing. You know, nobody says, gee, we shouldn't channel this aggression that young men have into boxing because then they might think, well, since it's okay to punch somebody when I'm in the ring, maybe it's okay to punch somebody when I'm out of the ring. Nobody says that, you know? And the data on that is pretty clear that uh, just because people get involved with boxing, they're not more likely to go out and, and punch somebody in the nose in a restaurant. So it's the same thing with um, with robots. The truth is that if somebody does have violent tendencies, I would think that anybody would want them to act out those fantasies with a robot rather than a real person. So I think that people who say, oh, what if people enjoy punching a robot or raping a robot, then they're going to want to rape somebody in real life. I think that's confused thinking because the truth is that if you get the satisfaction of raping a robot, you'll go back and rape a robot again. I also think what's true, and, and the research bears this out, that there is what uh, David Finkelhor calls this dark triad of personality characteristics, uh, that if you have a person, and it's usually but not always a male, but if you have a person who happens to score high on psychopathy and Machiavellianism and narcissism and a belief in... Um, in domination, then that person is more likely to be violent in real life. That's been true since the beginning of time. And, you know, other than putting all of those guys, uh, you know, on a little island in the middle of the Pacific, we have to learn how to live with those guys. And the question that every civilization has dealt with is, given that there's a very small number of men in our society, whatever century you're in, whatever continent you're on, given that there's a very small number of men who will pretty much convert anything into giving themselves permission to violence. You know, if you're mean to them, they respond with violence. If you're nice to them, they respond with violence. If you give them, you know, a piece of cake, they respond with violence. You know, what are we supposed to do with those guys? And I think there are a lot of answers to that. I think one of the worst answers to that is let's limit everybody else's right to protect us from that very small number of, um, of highly violent men. So, I'm not worried about how um, how sex robots or, or sex dolls are going to somehow increase the amount of sexual violence in the culture. The data that we have is that people who are going to be violent with objects, they're going to be violent with those objects. It's not like you have some perfectly nice Boy Scout milk drinking person. He acts out a fantasy with a robot and thinks, wow, that was really fun to slap a robot in the face. 
think I'll go slap my wife in the face. That's just not how it happens. Well, I think one of the arguments is that perhaps the pleasure that this abuser gets is seeing a tangible human response, seeing pain expressed and those sort of very horrible things. And if they're not getting that from this robotic character, then they might segue from the robot to a flesh and blood human being. I'm not sure how else to ask that question, but does that make sense? Well, well, I'm not sure I understand your question, but if the question is, if sadistic people use sex robots and the sex robots don't cry real tears, aren't they more likely to be sadistic with real people? Yes. And if that's your question, then the answer is, well, sadistic people are going to do what sadistic people are going to do. And um, if they don't get satisfaction from sex robots and they act out with real people, well, they were going to do that before the sex robots came along. It's not like the sex robots trigger some sadistic impulse in people. People either have sadistic impulses or they don't. People who have sadistic impulses, they learn how to deal with them. And a few, a small number of people who have sadistic impulses, they don't learn how to deal with them. And those people are acting out before sex robots were even invented, and they will continue to act out. I want to finish this segment with sort of a broader philosophical question about sort of shame culture and some of the puritanism that happens here in the United States. But as long as I'm in this vein, let's talk a little bit about the child sex robot. There was an article on your own website, June 19th, 2018, Congress criminalizes sex robots. You speak to H.R. 4655. The uh-huh. Creeper Act, curbing realistic <laughs> exploit- exploitative electronic pedophilic robots. The bill says right. there is a link in the bill. I was reading the language of it. It says there's uh-huh. a link between child sex dolls and participation in child pornography, that the dolls are a gateway to rape and they make the rape of human children easier, that they are part of an exploitation and objectification scenario that endangers children. And the bill uh-huh. proposed to make child sex dolls illegal. Now, I'll be very honest with you. I mean, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert. I want to root myself in the data. But as someone who is genuinely grieved by the notion of sexualizing children, molesting and penetrating a child, even in simulated or robotic form, I'm navigating my own mind on this. You know, is this a good thing? So let me just toss it out there. Well, if you look at that bill, the bill asserts that there's a connection between A and B. It's the equivalent of a bill that says, Given the fact that bananas are a proven source of poison, we, the legislature, want to limit people's access to bananas. Now, if the legislature, whether it's a state or the federal Congress, if a legislature wanted to ban bananas because the legislature believed that bananas contain poison, there's a procedure for investigating that that the Congress or the legislature would have to go through. They'd have to talk to scientists. They'd have to talk to banana growers, banana importers, banana marketers, and most important, banana consumers. They'd have to talk to a wide range of people before they could say that given that bananas are a source of poison, we're going to limit the importation of bananas. Now, frankly, if bananas are a source of poison, I want to see the science. And once you prove it to me, then absolutely build a wall at the border, to to coin a phrase, and keep those bananas out of here. (laughs) Now, Now, what this bill said, this bill asserted without one single study, without consulting one single expert, without ever actually seeing an actual doll, this bill asserted that there's a link between the use of these objects and other kinds of objectionable sexual behavior. There's absolutely no study that supports that idea. It's very attractive for a politician or a parent to say, anything that makes my kids safer, I'm in favor of. And of course, we all feel that way. Anything that makes kids safer, we're in favor of. You know, to the limit of we we don't want to infantilize the entire society. We don't want to say that since it's not okay for seven-year-olds to watch The Godfather 2, we should, you know, censor every adult's access to Godfather 2. Um, I believe it was Justice Frankfurter who said, no, it was Mark Twain, who said censorship is the idea that just because babies have no teeth, adults should not be allowed to eat steak. You know, which is brilliant. So the legislature says that given the fact 
that the use of these dolls leads to child molestation and sexual violence and all of that, we should limit access to these dolls. And if that were true, I'd be behind it 100%. But the thing is, the Congress or the legislature never cited one single study. It never convened a panel of experts. All it said was that if you take a piece of latex and you dress it up like a child, and you allow people to put their penises in those objects in private, that somehow that was going to trigger them, where they were not interested in having sex with children before, into being interested in having sex with children now. And that makes no sense at all. I ask you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and assume that you don't have sex with children, right? I'm going to assume that you don't want to have sex with children. And I ask you, is there any experience that you could possibly have that would change your mind? Is there any, any sex doll? Is there any uh, pornography? Is there any magazine article? Is there any anything? that anybody could say, is there any anything that you could do that at the end of that experience, you would say to yourself, huh, sex with a nine-year-old, that's a great idea. I'm going to go find me a nine-year-old. And the answer, of course, is no. The answer, of course, is no. The idea that absolutely healthy and reasonable people are not interested in having sex with children and that they can have one or two or three experiences with artificial objects and suddenly wake up one morning and say, hey, if it's that good with a doll, how much better would it be with a real kid? That's just crazy. On the grander stage, when we're talking about sexuality, sexual expression, uh, sexual liberation, the United States seems to be of two minds. We still have sort of a religious puritanism going on. And on the other side, we also seem to have a sexual revolution. Would you call it that? I mean, what are your thoughts? What I can tell you is that the country is not becoming more liberal about sex. The American people individually, individually, people in their own bedrooms, they are experimenting with more different kinds of partners and different kinds of consensual activities. There's no data that says that non-consensual sex is increasing. We're talking about it way more, but there's no data to suggest that it's increasing. There's no reason that it would be increasing. In fact, the rates of sexual exploitation of minors has actually gone down in the last 10 years, and the rates of sexual violence in general, according to the FBI, have gone down in the last 10 years. But our consciousness about it has been raised a great deal. So are we looking at a sexual revolution? Well, if, if you ask the average 23-year-old, they have access to a different range of partners than they used to, and people are investigating, am I, you know, am I bisexual, am I demisexual, am I trans, am I this, am I that? So in people's personal lives, they are investigating more things, more consensual things. But as a society, as a political culture, as an economic system, America is becoming way more conservative sexually than in the last 40 years. With the one exception, with the one exception of legalizing same gender sex and same gender marriage, this country has way more laws regulating our sexuality today than we did 30 years ago. You know, it's, it's harder to get an abortion. It's harder to have decent sex education for your kids in public school. It's harder to find contraception on campus in, in uh, the campus health center. There are lots of uh, sexually oriented speech that's now censored on college campuses that wasn't 30 years ago. And there are people who are pushing even, you know, harder to have even more regulations around our sexual behavior. So if there's a sexual revolution that's brewing here, it's, um, it's certainly not one that I welcome. I don't want to try to put a complex issue in a cookie cutter, but is most of this religiously motivated? Well, certainly the political power of the religious right is astonishingly high. It's a stu- the, the religious right is, is more powerful in this country than in any other developed country in the world. People in Italy, the, the home of the Pope, people in Germany and France and Spain, they're just astonished at how influential the church here is the fact that every taxpayer and that we subsidize churches by giving them all these tax breaks. You know, the Mormon church, for example, owns literally billions of dollars of commercial property that they don't pay any tax on. You know, if, if, if you open a restaurant, 
you have to pay taxes on the profits. If the Mormon church or the Catholic church or the Jewish synagogue or the Muslim mosque, if any religious institution opens a restaurant, they don't have to pay tax on the, on the profit, whereas you and I do, which gives them an enormous advantage when they own office buildings and farms and things like that. So, of course, organized religion in this country is extremely powerful, and every organized religion includes, as part of what their, their mission is, is to define normal sex in a very, very specific, very narrow way, and to talk about what are the kinds of sexual activities that God approves of, and what are the kinds of sexual activities that God disapproves of. Now, if you talk to an evangelical Christian, and you say, tell me about godly sex, they will point to scripture, and they'll say, just follow these rules, you know, don't have a man lying with a man, and, you know, don't have oral sex or this or that, uh, don't, don't go lusting after other women. And then, as long as you have heterosexual intercourse within a marriage, it's godly sex. Never mind the fact that it might involve physical pain, emotional suffering, it might involve manipulation, it might involve coercion. Organized religion is not really interested in that side of sexuality when they go about telling their followers how to implement their sex lives, how to express themselves sexually. And that's just shocking. You know, it's shocking that somebody would stand up and say, um, it's not okay to have, for a man to have sex with another man, but it's okay for a man to demand that his wife has sex with him when she's not in the mood because that's part of the divine plan. Well, if that's part of the divine plan, count me out of the divine plan. Dr. Marty Klein, is there a resource or a site or sort of a hub where people can find your work? I want to direct people to uh, your writings and other uh, offerings out there. Well, thank you. Uh, I suppose people could go to my website, and that's www.sexed.org, because I am a sex educator. So www.sexed.org, I have my blog there called Sexual Intelligence. You can read about my seven books that I've written about uh, various aspects of sex and relationships. You can see videos of me lecturing uh, all over the world about sexuality, where I'm training lawyers and doctors and psychologists and clergy and judges and all that. So I'd say my website is really the best place to start. Lots of free stuff there, lots of uh, well-written things, if I say so myself. And it's www.sexed.org. Not .com, sexed.org. Dr. Marty Klein, you've been very generous with your time and you've been uh, a huge part of the show. I'm so glad we were able to have a conversation to kind of cap this compelling and provocative subject matter. But it's nice to sort of tether it to some real science. And so your work's appreciated. Thank you so very much. Thanks a lot. That's about all the damage I can do on this subject here. I uh, hope you've enjoyed kind of a nice diversion from the usual subject matter. I'll see you back here next week. On the Thinking Atheist podcast, take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.